speaker is Dr. Stephen Blake. Steve Blake is a doctor of science specializing in nutritional biochemistry. He is director of nutritional neuroscience at the Maori Memory Clinic. He just published a clinical study in the Journal of Brain Sciences on reversing dementia. He is a research director at the Neuroscience Nutrition Foundation. He has recently credentialed to work in China setting up hospital programs to reverse disorders using nutrition. He is the author of 16 major works on the effects of nutrition on health, including nutrients for memory. Please welcome Dr. Blake. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I've got a fast-paced presentation for you tonight. And I'll try and entertain you, first of all, with the work that I've been doing for so long now. Uh, latest book, actually, Diabetes Breakthrough, uh, hot off the presses. And I'll talk about it a little bit during the talk tonight, about how to actually reverse diabetes and become free of it, rather than just take medication for the rest of your life and get into the complications, which are very unpleasant. I have a book on arthritis that I wrote. All of these are on non-drug approaches. I feel like the drug approaches are very well represented by our medical doctors. Uh, this is a Diet Doctor 2020, and that's about two weeks old now. Uh, you can put any, any food you ate, and there are now 292,060 foods to choose from. That's a lot of food choices. So if you eat a ding dong, you can find it in, find the nutritional value or lack thereof right there. Uh, migraines, I have a great program. We work with a lot of people with migraines and this really helps. Um, fats and Oils Demystified is a textbook that I wrote on fats and oils. There's been so much misinformation about fats and oils. Uh, some of it heard right here in this room. And it's really a good idea on my website, which is drsteveblake.com on the bottom here. You can get a copy of this for under $10. Most of these you can get for under $10 on my website. Uh, there's so many others. I will mention Nutrients from Memory. This is a result of a clinical trial that I wrote as lead author and ran with my wife, Catherine. And uh, so I wrote this book. She has a cookbook for Brain Power too, that she actually gave to the participants of the trial. And in fact, the brain and body food is a uh, vitamin supplement that we made for people who couldn't join the trial because they didn't, weren't qualified. Perhaps they were under 65 and it didn't meet the criteria for the trial. And so that is most of the things that we used in the trial. This is, by the way, just to show you that I'm not against drugs, Mosby's Drug Guide for Nurses, the fourth edition, and this is very, very widely known among health professionals as a quick reference for drugs. And I know that there's a place for drugs. Perhaps it's not the first line of treatment in every single case, though. That's what I'm gonna present about tonight. So a complete medical system starts with being healthy. And our medical system doesn't help too much with becoming really healthy and resistant to disease. The idea of, I caught a cold, makes you think it was a germ that's at fault. But in truth, we need to keep our resistance strong so that we don't, the germs just bounce off of us. I, I mean, I've been in contact with a lot of people over many years and haven't had a cold. I think maybe one in the last 10 years. Uh, so it certainly is possible to be resistant to a lot of diseases, not just infectious. Now, if we do experience a health problem, perhaps our joints are starting to ache or, or our blood sugar is elevated or we're getting a little memory loss, perhaps the first thing to do isn't to jump into a drug. I mean, by all means, use your health professionals to get a diagnosis and then see if there's some gentler way than jumping into a drug to do that. And then finally, if we're in a car wreck or we have a heart attack, we want modern medicine to save us and it's a wonderful thing. A few reasons why we can go beyond medication. Inflammation, chronic low-level inflammation is a big problem, say, with arthritis. Well, there's this fatty acid called arachidonic acid that is found in certain foods. And when we eat it, this arachidonic acid is transformed into, well, by the COX enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2, that's cyclooxygenase, transformed into in an intermediary hydroproxy acid, if you want to know the name, 
but then it gets turned into inflammatory leukotrienes. Now, the NSAIDs, aspirin, Advil, all those, they fight the COX-2 changing arachidonic acid into inflammatory leukotrienes. What if you didn't eat so much arachidonic acid? Would that help? Do you want to know where it's found? Yeah. Highest in turkey, chicken, and eggs, and second highest in all other animal products, none in plant-based foods. So it's good information to know. You might be able to cut down the side effects of those pain and inflammation medications dramatically just by lowering your arachidonic acid intake and help your arthritis too. If the chief contributing factors to heart disease are low antioxidants, causing more inflammation and, and free radical damage in the arteries, and high saturated fats, yes, you can take statin drugs. But what about addressing these causes so that you can become more healthy, more resistant to heart attacks, number one killer of Americans after all? And we worked with Alzheimer's patients extensively, and the drugs, donopezil and memantine, are not particularly good at slowing progression of brain damage, brain cell loss. They don't do that. But there are ways to do that. Currently, there are no drugs that work and are safe that can lower the accumulation of amyloid plaques, Alzheimer's plaques in the brain. And yet, we can do that with other nutrients. Uh, folate and vitamin B12 are two that work very well. This is covered in my book, Nutrients from Memory. Major causes of death in the US. The British Medical Journal came out uh, with a study a couple years ago, and they listed, now, they were just looking at medical mistakes in hospitals, okay? This doesn't include the fact that 40,000 people a year basically bleed internally to death from pain medications. It doesn't include all of the deaths and the millions of hospitalizations from correctly used drugs. These are just medical mistakes. And that's the third leading cause of death, according to this study. 251,000 people died. Millions and millions were hospitalized from medical mistakes. The point of the slide is that medicine can be a bit dangerous. Medication has some effects other than the desired effect. I think we know this from watching the TV commercials with all the fine print, but <laughs> all the terrible things it'll do to you. One of the things that we need for our own antioxidant enzyme systems to keep our brains healthy, to keep our joints healthy, keep our arteries healthy, we really need minerals. And there are specific minerals like selenium that's needed for glutathione peroxidase. Without it, it does not work. And then there are three minerals for the, the various forms of superoxide dismutase, copper, zinc, and manganese. The manganese is the most important one. Now, if you don't get these minerals, your brain cells can easily die. And if you do get them, you have defenses. You're tough. But medication doesn't supply these. You see what I mean? You can take any number of drugs, and I have yet to see one that contains any of these vital minerals, and then, of course, what about vitamins? Drugs don't contain vitamins either, do they? And this recent study, 2018, came out, and it was a large study, prospective study in China, and they found that vitamin C in the diet and in plasma, however you get it, reduced the risk of stroke by 54%. So the people with low vitamin C were 54% you know, more likely to get strokes than those with adequate vitamin C. And they were just looking at adequate, not optimal levels here, not at all. So vitamins are critically important, and the studies like this one are from peer-reviewed journals, and I have hundreds of studies on vitamin C alone, since I wrote a college textbook for McGraw-Hill called Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. Anyone heard of the Demystified series? It's, all, all sciences, all medical sciences um, by McGraw-Hill. Vitamins are important, but how many medications cover it? They don't, so we have to do it ourselves. We have to make sure we get our minerals and our vitamins, which is why I make this dietary analysis tool where you can look at, well, this is a paleo diet. Has anyone heard of the paleo diet? Sure, you've heard of the paleo diet. It's very much like the bulletproof diet, and I know you've heard of that one. Um, look at the calcium levels, tiny. And if you couple that with the protein levels being vastly too high, especially in this diet, 
the excess protein will also flush another three or 400 milligrams of calcium out of your body, leading to a negative daily balance of calcium. So instead of getting 1,000 milligrams of calcium like you need every day, you're actually getting less than zero because you're flushing calcium from your bones every single day on this diet. Now, why would someone make a diet like this knowing that it would flush your calcium out of your bones? They didn't know. The guy was an anthropologist. He just made up the diet and he never tested it. So I think that diet being the foremost reason that we stay healthy or get sick, it's not a bad idea to check maybe once a month your diet. Get a handle on which foods you're high in, which things you're low in, and adjust it with your diet if at all possible. What do you think? Does that make sense? Now, doctors say, well, we have prevention. We have a colon screening kit. Here, take this colon screening kit, and this will prevent your colon cancer. But it doesn't. It doesn't stop it. Breast screening doesn't stop breast cancer. Stopping eating dairy products, now that drops your risk of breast cancer through the floor. But taking a screening for, with a mammogram will actually raises the risk of certain cancers as it, it perhaps can catch other cancers earlier and give you a better outcome. I'm not saying screening is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. But it's not going far enough. We need actual prevention. For instance, in my book, Stop, Stop Strokes, you can see that diet alone can drop your stroke risk by 99%. Strokes are not only horrible for the person getting them, but they're catastrophic for the caregivers. And it is really a favor to your loved ones not to become a drooling vegetable. And how about a 99% reduction? And all based on peer-reviewed studies. True risk reduction is going to go a little further. How many of your doctors have asked you about your diet? Anyone here had a medical doctor ask him about his diet? Could you please raise your hand? Yes? OK, three. That's three people. That's more than I've ever heard. Um, it's very rare. But if you take your dog to a vet, he's going to ask you what you feed him, right? First thing. We could diagnose fitness levels. I think all of us could improve our fitness levels. I know I've slid a little on my running and, and uh, calisthenics on this trip, but we can all get better at our fitness. And the more fit you are, the less chance that you're going to get sick and die. And what about a stress profile? Stress impacts our immune system, our ability to fight off disease and cancer. So if we can keep our stress levels to a reasonable level, and there's so many ways to do this, but the first step is taking a stress profile, seeing what stresses you out, and what you can do to ameliorate that problem. And finally, as was evidenced today with Lena Pu, the environment has an effect on us, a big effect. And I'm not so sure about 5G because I haven't seen all the studies yet, but I know that there are many persistent organic pollutants that contribute to, for instance, Parkinson's disease by killing off dopamine-producing cells in the brain, Alzheimer's disease. Many of the diseases are related partially, especially lung diseases with air pollution, to pollution. So hopefully a doctor of the future will look at all of these things in a more holistic way and not just say, your blood test came back, I don't see any red flags, or this one's a little high. What we want, if we have a condition like arthritis or Alzheimer's disease, is we don't want it to get worse. I talked to a lot of old folks with Alzheimer's disease, and they say, if I just didn't get worse, Everything would be okay. I could adapt to this memory loss situation. So Alzheimer's disease will progress despite the only two drugs that are used for it, donopezil and memantine. But we can slow, stop, or even, as in my clinical trial with a team, we did reverse Alzheimer's disease. We, it, they were just getting into dementia when we started the trial and just about perfectly normal when we ended nine-month trial. In fact, most all of them had gone up within one month to much better cognition and memory. Cartilage destruction progresses. Pain pills, they don't stop the progression, but that's what medical science gives you. We need to go beyond that medication and stop the cartilage from degenerating. I'll give you some ideas as we go on here. And diabetes certainly progresses, and the doctors don't stop it from progressing. 
What they basically do is keep you on medication for life and change the medication here and there, and you get worse and worse over time. Very good economics, very poor healing. But uh, as my new book on diabetes shows, we can actually stop and reverse progression of diabetes if we're willing to change our diets. Of course, that's a pretty big if. The gold standard for medical studies is that there are double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials. Nine of these gold-plated studies showed that ginkgo biloba delayed and treated Alzheimer's disease. How many doctors in America prescribe ginkgo biloba for dementia? I would say close to zero. Never heard of it happening. Uh, very recently, in 2019, this study came out on the bottom. Treatment of dementia and mild cognitive impairment with or without cerebrovascular disease. Expert consensus. Experts from all over the world came together and put this paper together. And it has been thought that blood anticoagulants such as warfarin, coumadin, or Eliquis, Pradaxa, Xeralto, any of the blood thinners would cross-react with ginkgo. And in our clinical trial, we rejected people with blood thinners because we're giving them ginkgo. However, in this worldwide study that just came out very comprehensive, they found no problems with blood coagulation. Although ginkgo does thin your blood, and that's one of the ways it helps blood get to the brain, especially good for vascular dementia. But they found that only ginkgo and not the drugs, not the medications, improve cognition, behavior, and activities of daily living. Now, Donna Pezzel really damages activities of daily living with nausea at 76% of people who take it. And of course, ginkgo never killed anybody. It's safe, yeah. Dosage is in my book, Nutrients for Memory, and we used a standardized extract, so each and every capsule had the exact same amount. And it's standardized for three different parameters. One we needed to keep low, and the other two at the exact high levels. So use a standardized extract, and the exact dosage is in there. Uh, what about supplements? How many doctors in, have prescribed a supplement? Anyone here has had a doctor prescribe a supplement? Okay, you have, you have a good doctor. Uh, anyone else? Supplements, anybody? Yeah? Okay, a couple. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I mean a medical doctor, of course. Um, good, good. Well, you're an exceptional MD, and I congratulate you. Uh, so, for instance, S adenosyl methionine, known as SAMI popularly, or SAM in the technical literature, decreases amyloid beta production, quoting the article, thus preventing Alzheimer's disease. This is from Molecular Neurobiology in 2018. Good study. Um, SAMI was shown to lower secretion of amyloid beta from another study, also in 2018. So we know that we can slow the production of amyloid beta because SAMe methylates really works well. It's scientifically proven, but except for our one exceptional doctor, doctors are not recommending SAMe to their patients with memory loss and who are developing amyloid plaque in their brain. Perhaps they should be. We can go beyond medication. Luckily, it's over the counter. You can go to Costco and buy a bottle. I don't know if you caught this in the news. This was about less than a week ago. A peanut powder called Palforzia will be sold by a drug company for $4,200 a year. Actually, prices range from $3,000 to $20,000 a year for peanut powder in tiny quantities. This is for kids with peanut allergies. Here's the reason why the kids don't just eat a little bit of peanut butter every day to keep their resistance up instead of spending $4,200 because it's not FDA certified. When peanut powder becomes FDA certified, then the doctor can prescribe it and get paid. He can do a recheck in three months and get paid. He can, he can have it as prescription and your insurance will cover it. And the person is happy because they just have their copay and don't have to pay for it. Their copay is going to be a lot more than a jar of peanut butter, which would last about 10 years at the dosage they're using here. So this is one reason why, and it's a business reason. It's, it's not about your health. It's a business reason why doctors are not prescribing all of these things. I mean, how often does a doctor prescribe fiber? Well, maybe if you have constipation, but what about lowering heart attack risk by 
and cancer by 17%. I don't think doctors normally recommend more fiber for heart attacks and cancer, <laughs> with one exception. The highest fiber intakes reduce inflammation and osteoarthritis by about 50%. Reducing inflammation and osteoarthritis is excellent. It reduces progression, free radical damage, cartilage destruction. This is what we want. We really want that. Stroke risk, if you get 35 grams a day of fiber rather than very little, 35% less risk of getting a stroke. That's one of the 99% reduction that I'll tell you about. And fitness is certainly something that goes beyond medication. And I know my doctors have never asked me about my fitness program. And, you know, I'd love to tell them, hey, I'm a runner, and I really get out there and, and you know, get myself aerobic. But they don't. I think they should. But since they don't, you can, and you should. And you should get yourself on a program of fitness, gradually increasing your fitness. If you do it too quick, well, you could get the heart attack you're trying to avoid. Also, environmental toxins. Now, according to the study that just came out in the prestigious journal Chest in 2018, air pollution is the fifth leading risk factor for death in the world. Both indoor and outdoor pollution, ultrafine particles penetrate into the lungs and into the organs, sometimes even into the cells. By the way, this study was an expert consensus of experts from all over the world, a worldwide study, very, very well done. We don't usually think about the fifth leading risk factor in the world being air pollution. I mean, that's ignoring all of the, the chemicals that are in our environment and, and the cell phones and everything else, that just this one aspect. Another study looked at the pollution in beef, pork, and chicken. And because of the pesticides and persistent organic pollutants, they concluded that a child could only eat one serving at most five times per month without exceeding their toxic load of persistent organic pollutants. And they just looked at a few of them. And then Alzheimer's disease certainly raised with exposure to contaminants, such as DDE, which is the breakdown product of DDT. I'm going to talk just for a minute about inflammation. In the brain, chronic low-level inflammation increases cell death and increases dementia. In the arteries, increased inflammation causes more macrophage attacks, which then creates the arterial plaque that when a flap breaks off and you get a clot, then you will possibly have an ischemic heart attack or an ischemic stroke. Arthritis pain and damage directly related to inflammation. So if you can lower it, for instance, by eating less turkey, chicken, and eggs, um, you may be able to cut your medication down and the side effects of your medication down. You may need, of course, to talk to your doctor about any change in prescription medication. Over-the-counter medication, you can probably adjust yourself. In diabetes, one of the worst problems is diabetic retinopathy, blindness from diabetes, damage to the retina of the eye, very sensitive. Now, of course, it'd be great if you ate lots of green vegetables for the lutein and its enantiomer zeaxanthine. They really help protect the retina of the eye. But inflammation speeds its, its damage. It also speeds damage to the kidneys and the arteries in diabetes, too. A good idea to reduce inflammation. What can we do? Well, number one, we can eliminate endotoxins. Okay. If there's a bacteria in your bloodstream or, or a broken bacteria in your bloodstream, your body senses it. The shell of that bacteria is called an endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. Our bodies are designed to find and attack when there's any endotoxins in our body. Well, unfortunately, when you eat meat, chicken, fish, or dairy products, there are endotoxins that leak into the blood system. This has been well proven by many studies, including, of course, the one up on your screen. When they go into your system, the body ramps up inflammation, which can make the arthritis worse, more damage to your brain from, from uh, the brain immune system basically attacking itself. In other words, it's not a good idea. For two or three hours after a meal in, with animal fat, then you're going to have raised lipopolysaccharides and raised inflammation. And that's just from breakfast. What about after lunch? What about after dinner? People wind up with high inflammation from endotoxins all day long. 
So that's one contributing factor that's in your control, especially with impossible burgers at Whoppers. Uh, <laughs> they don't have endotoxins. They're not particularly healthy, but they don't have endotoxins. Um, now, who's heard of advanced glycation end products? Very good, very good. Advanced glycation end products are twisted, perverted proteins that can't be broken down by our body and increase, for instance, in the brain, they increase free radical destruction of brain cells by 50 times, it's been estimated. What are they? What are they? Okay, if you were to fry, broil, or barbecue uh, meat, chicken, or fish, these advanced glycation end products form when sugar is attached to the proteins. When you eat them, the smaller ones are absorbed, raising your blood level of AGEs, raising pain in the joints. There's actually a receptor in the brain that, called RAGE, <laughs> receptor for advanced glycation end product, that puts those AGEs into your brain, causing more inflammation in the brain, more free radical destruction of brain cells, and that's what kills off brain cells until you have half your brain cells left in advanced Alzheimer's disease. That's what it's all about, preserving our brain cells in that one. Uh, if it's fried brown and if, it's an, if, if there's any water in the food, you know, so if you barbecue tofu, no, you can't make an advanced glycation end product. It, it breaks the cycle. Uh, I won't go into the deep science on that. Uh, yeah, browned. Browned meat. By the way, AG is also found in aged cheese. So in our clinical trial, our guidelines were for people not to eat barbecued, fried, or broiled meats, chicken, or fish, or aged cheese. We did not have a prohibition for AGEs because milk has none. But when it's aged, the sugars and the proteins lock together. By the way, in diabetes, glycation in the blood, glycation of hemoglobin is the best way to determine diabetes. And this glycation in the blood directly affects diabetes and drives diabetes onward. So there's another good reason not to eat advanced glycation in products. However, People don't like steamed or poached food. You know, would you like a poached steak? <laughs> Not very appetizing, is it? And then there's arachidonic acid, which I mentioned earlier, a fat found only in animal products. We make all we need. We shouldn't eat any because it raises inflammation in the body through the cyclooxygenase pathways. Now, on the other hand, you could eat more quercetin to quench inflammation in your body. Onions, grapes, apples, and beans. These are healthy foods that reduce inflammation, and they're powerful. They have a real effect. You can, you can look at the inflammatory markers in the blood, C-reactive protein, various interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and you can find that the inflammation has gone down as a result of eating these healthy, delicious foods. Berries and anthocyanins, which are uh, really healthy, decrease diabetes risk 23%, and even reverse memory loss in aging. Uh, one study with the nurses' health study, they were able to delay dementia by an average of two years with a cup of berries a day. A delicious way to put off. And in my study, I put a cup of berries a day in the study. Oh, anthocyanins are the colorful pigments that you'll see in berries. <laughs> Depending on the acidity, they may be blue, purple, or black. Uh, so green grapes, no. But the, blue, the purple and the black grapes, yes. Blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, pretty much all of the ones with pigment have these anthocyanins. They're like magic. They can penetrate right into the hippocampus memory area of the brain and sit there like a guard defending against antioxidation, against oxidation and inflammation. <coughs> so good to have your berries every day. I hope we all inspire you on that one. Of course, medication does not supply antioxidants. There are one or two medications that have been used that do actually have antioxidant value, but they're not widely used. Um, antioxidants protect brain cells from death and memory loss. Arteries by protecting LDL. If your LDL is not oxidized, it doesn't tend to stick to your artery walls and contribute to this plaque problem. Antioxidants protect diabetic damage to arteries and eyes and kidneys. That's what we want. If we can protect against the damage of raised blood sugar, that's really good. And we can also lower the blood sugar by getting rid of insulin resistance. <coughs> and in strokes, after a stroke, you have reperfusion injury, which actually damages more of the brain than the stroke itself. 
And this can be stopped if there are enough of these antioxidants. So what, what are they? What are antioxidants? Carotenoids, the colorful pigments in fruits and vegetables shown right here. Those are lots of carotenoids in there. Some of the carotenoids can be turned into vitamin A. Those are called carotenes. Vitamin C is in fruits and vegetables. Vitamin E only in the natural forms, but not synthetic alpha tocopherol. And polyphenols, anthocyanins are one of the polyphenols, many polyphenols. But they're in plant foods, whole plant foods. And then we have our own internal antioxidants. Very important, I mentioned selenium's necessary, manganese, copper, and, and zinc are necessary for, for these internal ones. One more internal one, our only fat-soluble internal antioxidant is coenzyme Q10. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's a supplement you can take, and as you get older, you may need it a little more. We use CoQ10 in the clinical trial on dementia, along with lots of other things. What about supplements? The problem is that most supplements are made by greedy manufacturers with the worst possible quality and tiny quantity so that they're either worthless or worse than worthless. Um, I actually oversee the manufacturer of the brain and body food to make sure that the manufacturer doesn't degrade the quality and there have been many arguments along that score. So far I'm winning, uh, but it is, it's, it's tough because they always want to go cheap. Always want to cheapen the ingredients. Most of your antioxidants should come from food. You could supplement vitamin C. There's many reasons I don't have time to get into, but you could. Um, vitamin E should not be supplemented unless it's the RRR, alpha tocopherol form, and contains the mixed tocopherols. And vitamin A should really come from carotenoids. The animal forms can be toxic. Supplements of vitamin E and C were recently shown in a 2017 study confirm lower rates of dementia by 40%, just getting these two antioxidants. So I'm gonna briefly discuss Alzheimer's disease. So for Alzheimer's disease, the drugs, like donopezil, has minimal effects on cognition, unless you up the dosage, and when you do, you get 76% more vomiting, 62% more diarrhea. The loss of quality of life from these side effects is so much that many people don't want to take their donopezil. And memantine is very questionable helpfulness in dementia, but it has terrible side effects, including blood clots and psychosis. And it doesn't help, but ginkgo does and doesn't have any of these side effects, except, as you mentioned, with blood thinners, I'd still be cautious with ginkgo. I'm a cautious person. How do we reduce oxidation? Oxidation of brain cells, killing off of brain cells. In our study, we used vitamin C. We used a special form of vitamin E, and you should not get off-the-shelf vitamin E because it's actually slightly damaging. We used copper, zinc, manganese, and selenium to support our own inside endogenous antioxidants. We used coenzyme Q10 and anthocyanins from berries. So this is a broad approach to boosting health. Not a single thing, but lots of things together. Now, how did we stop amyloid plaque buildup we use folate and a special form of vitamin B12 called methylcobalamin. Then we use SAMe, and we reduce saturated fats to less than 7% of calories. Now that's because higher saturated fats result in more cholesterol in the blood, and that directly causes more amyloid plaques to form. So by lowering the saturated fat, we reduce the amyloid plaques forming, and by epigenetically quenching the genes that make alpha, beta, and gamma secretase, then we can stop the, the amyloid plaques from forming almost completely. By the way, this graph shows at the beginning uh, on the left and at the end on the right of nine months, the mini mental state exam scores. They went from borderline dementia, actually inside dementia, to completely normal in nine months. In fact, as you can see, the first month, we had tremendous results, just, just in the first three months. So these things really work. Um, I was the lead author of that, and uh, the paper's in the Journal of Brain Sciences this year. Um, we also added ginkgo biloba and go to cola. We reduced advanced glycation end products, and we reduced saturated fat. Now, just breezing through osteoarthritis here, um, these are the drugs that are used for osteoarthritis, you know, pain and inflammation drugs. Cardiovascular death from heart attack and stroke increase for Celebrex was 47% more. 
That's pretty bad. Uh, Vioxx is even worse, but they took it off the market. For Voltaren, another very common anti-inflammatory painkiller, 44% more heart attacks and strokes. Now, Advil and Aleve, widely used for arthritis pain, only gave you 20% uh, more heart attacks and strokes, but do you really want kidney and liver failure and gastro gastrointestinal bleeding? How about just cutting down on the arachidonic acid? For arthritis, we want to reduce weight for leg, for hip and knee arthritis. Continue activity is very important. Boost antioxidant intake, I've told you about that. Beans contain phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine. This is what synovial fluid, our lubricating factor in our joints, is made from. So if you want to keep your joints healthy and your cartilage from crumbling away, you should have a few beans in your life. And to build collagen, which is what cartilage is based on, you need these nutrients. And consider taking vitamin D. Sam E, which I've mentioned before, has helped arthritis sufferers as much as Celebrex, a very powerful painkiller. There are also, of course, many foods that you can use. I have a book on arthritis, and uh, you can get it here at the table or download it on my website, drsteveblake.com. Interesting study just came out, and as I'm reading it, I put it in this slide. They did a, a really good statistical analysis for large clinical effect, medium or small effect. It looks like the peels of the colored passion fruit, when they extract those, it's the most powerful medicine for arthritis. It's not a medicine. It's not FDA approved. It's not dangerous. It's a fruit peel but it seems to work very well. Now, we already know turmeric and boswellia and pycnogenol are widely used for arthritis and with great success. People are always telling me how good boswellia is for their arthritis. But this is a clinical trial, not anecdotal evidence. So, blackberry powder smoothie. Inflammation cut in half in 12 weeks. Ginger reduced pain. Ginger reduces pain in migraines and arthritis very, very effectively. Ginger is a wonderful painkiller. Uh, side effects are all good, unless you get indigestion from it, and then obviously it's not for you. Vitamin E, very important for joints. The cartilage breaks away without it. So we really have a lot of things we can do to keep our joints healthy and strong. I'm happy and proud to say I'm 69 years old, and I run for an hour and 20 minutes up hard hills and uh, half cross country, and thank you, half on the highway. And I intend to keep it up um, <laughs> as long as I can. And no, actually my knees are good, but I very gradually worked up to it, okay? That's the key. You know, I mentioned diabetes in my new book. I only have five minutes left. Um, Meta-analysis found that looking at 1.4 million patient months of treatment, the, the drugs for arthritis, for diabetes really didn't help prevent death or heart attack. They didn't really help people live longer. They lowered the blood sugar, but they didn't lower the effects of diabetes. So what can you do? Well, the key factor here brought out in my brand new book, uh, Diabetes Breakthrough, The Key to Insulin Resistance. I have a couple copies. If you know someone with diabetes, this is the way to reverse it. The way you reverse it is by lowering the saturated fats because the saturated fats create insulin resistance. And I'll show you briefly how that works. Uh, on the left is how it should work. Insulin locks onto an insulin receptor in a cell membrane. Well, there's half as many insulin receptors if you're eating the normal excess saturated fat. Then the insulin substrate receptor has to dock on, but it can't because saturated fat interferes with that docking. Then we have phosphatidyl and osetol-3 kinase and protein kinase B that are necessary for GLUT4, the glucose transporter module. It's a little vesicle. It goes up to the cell surface membrane and drinks in the glucose into the cell. Doesn't work with the saturated fat. So you wind up with high blood sugar, high blood insulin, and low energy because it's not getting into the cell. Now, saturated fat also interferes with glycogen production or storage form of energy in the cells. In addition, the excess saturated fatty acids from animal foods or coconut oil will kill off the beta cells that make insulin. You can only make insulin in beta cells, and as those cells are inactivated and killed off, you can no longer make insulin. You know, hence, in advanced diabetes, you need to actually take insulin 
regardless of its ridiculous price. A lot of trials have shown reduced blood sugar. Look at this, 282 to 89 milligrams per deciliter. That's a pretty dramatic lowering of blood sugar from raging diabetes to non-diabetes. Uh, that took 10 months, that study. The studies vary, but in many of the studies, I, and I just gave a talk on diabetes last night in San Francisco, uh, in two weeks, even in one week, this change of diet has reversed the diabetes. And coincidentally, people are no longer needing their blood pressure medication or their cholesterol medication because it normalizes all of those. Doctors do not recommend these, except perhaps our one great doctor here. Um, if you wanted to reduce blood glucose, why not try ginger, fenugreek, thyme, barberry, walnuts? They're great. If you want to increase insulin, how about palm juice or olives or nettles or Panax ginseng, a great regulator of our hormones? These are real ways to deal with, these are beyond medication. And your doctor is very unlikely to prescribe these, so you're going to have to do it yourself. Uh, if you want to reverse diabetes, it's not very complicated. I recommend you get my book because I can't go into it too much here. Um, this is talking about statins. They don't really help with heart disease so much, and the muscle problems cause a lot of people to discontinue them. The China study showed us that in a quarter million men under 65, None of them got a heart attack in Guizhou County, whereas in America, 738 would have. Not necessary. You can unclog an artery that looks like this into an artery that looks like this, and these are actual photomicrographs of that happening. Angiograms. Uh, you can clean up your arteries, in other words. So you can eat berries and veggies for antioxidants, some walnuts and flax for omega-3s, eliminate animal fats completely and lower cholesterol. By the way, I've been plant-based for 49 years now. Uh, it's quite a, quite a long time, isn't it? Uh, keep fit and relax. So that's heart attacks. Now, I've got a couple slides on strokes and I'll wrap it up. These are the things that lowered the risk of strokes. And the next slide, I'll show you how they did that. But that's a pretty good reduction in risk. Um, soy foods, 80% less risk. For those people who ate one to two servings a day, 80% less risk of strokes. Believe me, I've seen a lot of strokes and they're nasty. I mean, little strokes aren't so bad, but the bigger ones are really awful. You don't want to go there. And soy foods are very protective, principally because of the genistein, a powerful anti-inflammatory and diazdine and several other components. Higher fiber intake, 65% less risk of stroke. Less white rice, 63%. Uh, dinner tonight I was offered white rice and I, I thought of the 63% reduced risk of stroke if I didn't have it, and I didn't have it. Uh, <laughs> cruciferous vegetables, 33% le less risk. Two cups of fresh fruit per day, as opposed to people who eat little, little fruit, 32% less risk. Nuts, seeds, and salad, they all help reduce your risk of a stroke. So please go beyond medication. This is my message to you. I've written many books on how to go beyond medication. Get, get any that apply to you and supplement your doctor with your own good sense and do what you need to do to keep yourself fit and happy and relaxed and well. And uh, we certainly wanna hear more about 5G, but these are some very well-documented problems uh, that we can do a lot about, and uh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.